Good evening, everyone, and good day to you all. I hope you had a wonderful evening or day wherever you are, because of course tonight we are connecting with USA, Miami. So of course I just want to make sure that uh, that you are well and ready to find out a bit on our topic tonight, which is definitely an interesting topic. As you know, we are continuing with the topics on male fertility, and this time we have sperm aspiration techniques and that all will be explained by Dr. Thomas Masterson's, uh, Masterson, sorry. and uh, welcome, welcome Dr. Thomas, how are you feeling tonight? I'm uh, doing great, I really appreciate you inviting me on, um, look forward to giving a, a, an overview of sperm aspiration techniques. Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight, but also for um, agreeing to be prese presenting this topic for us. And uh, well, as always, to those who don't know, uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Thomas' presentation. And afterwards, your favorite part, you will be able to ask your questions. As always, just put those in the chat section and uh, Dr. Thomas will answer them for you. Uh, one by one, so don't hesitate. Anything that's on your mind, you can go ahead, type those in, and uh, he will be uh, able to help you, I'm sure of it. And let me just mention that, of course, uh, Dr. Thomas Masterson, he is the assistant professor in urology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And so um, I guess we can start with the presentation, right? Sure, let's do it. Okay, let's go ahead then. All right. Well, again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tom Masterson. I'm a uh, physician at the University of Miami. Um, I'm trained in urology and specifically uh, had done, have done a fellowship in uh, sexual medicine and infertility. Uh, in my practice, I see really just the male side. So it's uh, with that, we'll kind of get into the talk. All right. So just before we begin, uh, just to some disclaimers and disclosures. Uh, first is that there will be some pictures of genitalia in this talk. Uh, and the second thing is that I practice in the United States. And the reason I mention this is fertility coverage is different, you know, even throughout the U.S., but in other countries. Uh, and this coverage may sometimes dictate, you know, what is done. Uh, some places will cover uh, IVF, some only cover IUI. And part of aspiration uh, and obtaining sperm is we're working towards the couple's goal. Uh, so things that I say may only be uh, you know, applied to certain areas. So first and foremost, why do we retrieve sperm? Well, sperm is one half of the equation. You can't really, you can't do this reproductive process if you don't have both an egg and you don't have sperm. So sperm retrievals are reserved for patients who are unable to supply a sperm sample. These situations include an ejaculation where patients physically or, or are just unable to provide a sample and we don't know whether or not they even make sperm. Another situation is where patients can pro provide an ejaculated sample, but there just may not be any sperm within it. This situation, one of them is called obstructive azospermia. Azospermia just means that there's no sperm in the ejaculate. And this can be formed by a blockage. Common scenario here in the US are patients, uh, patients who have had a prior vasectomy and are now looking to have children. That's, a, that's an, uh, an example of obstructive azospermia. Another situation is, is non-obstructive azospermia. In these instances, the patients actually are not making very much sperm. So there's no blockage, it's just the testicle is not producing sperm in large enough quantities to actually see it in the ejaculate. So again, situations would be an ejaculation, obstructive azospermia, and non-obstructive azospermia. So where do we find sperm? Well, the easiest and usually the most common is in the ejaculate. And again, the ejaculated sperm is what can be provided by the patient. Uh, this can either be collected through masturbation or other techniques. The second most common location for sperm would be the epididymis. As you can see here in the diagram, the epididymis sits on top of the testicle, and this is where sperm is actually stored. It's also in this area that sperm gains motility. And then the testicle, this is where sperm basically it develops, starting from the most immature to getting to a matured state. 
each of these locations has sperm of different quality that can only be used for certain uh, assisted reproductive techniques, which we'll get into in the next slide. So what can sperm be used for? Sperm can be used for really three main things outside of natural, re, uh, natural conception. The first is intrauterine insemination or IUI. IUI is the process where they take the sperm, concentrate it, uh, and inject it into the uterus. Not all types of retrievals can be, can be used for intrauterine insemination. The second type is in vitro fertilization. In the classic in vitro or IVF, sperm and egg are put together in a dish and allowed to fertilize on their own. Again, only motile or moving sperm can really be used for this technique. And then the last is intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. In ICSI, you take a single sperm and inject it into an egg to fertilize. Now, the details of all of these, I won't get into such in, into, uh, as it's sort of outside the scope of, of this talk. But the reason I introduce these is as we go through the various areas where we can collect sperm, um, I will state to you whether or not the sperm is, is usually suitable for these techniques. So we'll start with ejaculated sperm. So ejaculated sperm is the probably the most common way that we, we get sperm. This is what we do for semen analyses and how we generally get uh, understand quality of people's sperm. The benefit of ejaculated sperm is that it is moving, so it's easier for the embryologist to determine which sperm they're going to use. It's fully matured, and it also contains the lowest aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is DNA, uh, abnormal DNA within the sperms. What happens is, is as it moves to the reproductive tract, Sperm that contains aneuploidy tends to die off and doesn't make it to the ejaculate. The downside of ejaculated sperm is for some patients, this is the area with the highest DNA fragmentation. DNA fragmentation happens as, as the sperm matures and it is exposed to things like reactive oxygen species or the body's own uh, immune system, this can cause small damage to the DNA that's in the sperm. And unfortunately, those sperm do actually make it into the ejaculate and can survive. I mention this only because some patients may have questions on DNA fragmentation, uh, but usually that's not so much a consideration in most cases. How is ejaculated sperm obtained? Well, the most common way is through masturbation. Some patients will use collection condoms. And for patients who have ejaculatory disorders, there's penile vibratory stimulation and electroejaculation. Ejaculated sperm is great because it can be used usually for intrauterine insemination, assuming we have large enough quantities, IVF, or ICSI. Here at this table on the right, this is just showing fertilization rates of ejaculated sperm versus surgically retrieved sperm. And what it's showing is that fertilization rates are higher with ejaculated sperm. But when we go to look at clinical pregnancy rates, meaning a positive pregnancy test, you see that the rates are similar. So this is just an image showing what penile vibratory stimulation is. It's a, it's, we, we use a vibrator device to actually place on the penis to, um, to stimulate the ejaculation. Now this is usually used in spinal cord injured patients and, and is not often used in patients uh, outside of spinal cord injury. These images depict electro ejaculation. Again, this is usually for patients who are spinal cord injured or have damage to the pelvic nerves. So patients like poorly controlled diabetics who may not be able to ejaculate. Something I would like to point out is there is a difference between orgasm and ejaculation. Many men have a hard time differentiating these two, but we do have patients that orgasm but do not ejaculate. EEJ or electroejaculation may be a solution for that. Here in this image, what we're showing is under general anesthesia, if you're not spinal cord injured, uh, if you're spinal cord injured, this can actually be done uh, without general anesthesia. Uh, but a probe is placed into the rectum and it directly stimulates the prostate and the seminal vesicles to almost force ejaculation. And again, why go through all this effort? It's because ejaculated sperm has, the, has sort of the most utility. It can be used for really any one of the assisted reproductive techniques. 
Next, we'll move to the epididymis. So epididymal sperm, what's nice about it is that it's moving and it is fairly mature. And again, motile sperm is great because we assume that moving sperm, or we know that moving sperm is alive. We assume that sperm that's not moving is dead, especially in the ejaculate. So when we see motile sperm, that's typically the sperm we're trying to use in techniques like ICSI. The drawback is the epididymis is where the sperm actually gains its motility. So depending on where the sperm is retrieved in the epididymis, the motility may be fairly low. There are two main ways that we get sperm from the epididymis. One is called a percutaneous epididymal aspiration, or PESA. The other is a microepididymal sperm aspiration, or MESA. And we'll talk about these in more detail in the next slides. Epididymal sperm, in rare cases, can be used for IUI, but is usually used for IVF or ICSI. Here, looking off to the tables on the right, in the top, we're comparing the, the fertilization rates of epididymal versus testicular sperm. And again, epididymal sperm is moving, so as you expect, it actually does have a higher fertilization rate. And even when we look at clinical pregnancies, you see a slightly higher clinical pregnancy rate. Despite this, in this particular study, that's, that difference was not statistically significant. Something else that I'll bring up at this time is once we start getting into many of these uh, sperm retrieval techniques, there's a question about using fresh versus frozen sperm. Fresh sperm means the day that we retrieve the sperm, we would be, in, in, we would be trying to fertilize the eggs. In frozen sperm, a fer or a frozen cycle, we would actually freeze the sperm ahead of time thaw it out, and then use that to do the fertilization. And what I want you to take away from this is that the difference in fertilizations and clinical pregnancy rate are not substantially different between frozen and fresh sperm. So here we're depicting the PESA. This is the percutaneous sperm aspiration. And the way this is performed is usually under local anesthesia, a needle is directed into the epididymis, and with light suction, we try to pull out some of the fluid and ho that hopefully contains sperm. The benefit of this procedure is that it's fairly quick, it's done with local anesthesia, and it doesn't require um, much coordination or use of a microscope. The downside to it is the yield of sperm that you get is low. It may require multiple attempts, and the more times you stick the epididymis, the more scarring that may develop, making future attempts more difficult. Compare this to the microepididymal sperm aspiration, which is actually a procedure done under local or under general anesthesia. In this procedure, the testicle is actually delivered through an incision and brought, uh, brought a microscope is used to actually look at the tubules directly and then we place a needle into them to, again, aspirate sperm. This generally has a higher yield of sperm, and because of that, we can often get multiple vials that can be saved and used for future IVF cycles. The drawbacks are it does require general anesthesia. Potentially, it's more painful since we are causing, we're making larger incisions, and it does require the use of an operating microscope. So here is an image of a MESA. This is me and one of my colleagues uh, actually performing this procedure. And in the, the left bottom, what you're seeing is this is an actual dilated epididymis. It may be hard to appreciate since I don't have a comparison picture, but usually when you look at the epididymis in a patient who is not obstructed, you don't see these big dilated tubules. Here it almost looks like a brain, they're super dilated. And then in the right-hand side, you can see what, uh, what uh, the results of a, of a MESA may be. Again, it's hard to tell in here, but all of those little white specks are actually sperm. And something else I want to point out is there's not much background. So there's not a lot of red blood cells and there's not other tissue. So it makes these samples nice, clean, and easy for the embryologist to use. So comparing PESA and MESA, and again, these are techniques used when people are obstructed. So that example is, again, someone who's maybe had a prior vasectomy. And what you see is that PESA tends to have lower retrieval rates, so 61% to 93%. However, then when you look at fertilization and clinical pregnancy, they're essentially the same. So 
pace of maybe you don't get as much sperm and you're not as successful, but once you have it, it's usually good quality. I personally prefer mesas. Uh, the reason for this is the much higher sperm retrieval rate uh, and the fact that you can often have leftover sperm uh, for future cycles of IVF. So again, this is just a reiteration of looking at the difference between testicular and epididymal sperm. Since we will talk about testicular sperm next, uh, I do want to just, met, again, reiterate that testicular sperm tends to have lower fertilization rates. All right, so now we're moving into the testis. So testicular sperm is the most immature. It's within the testicle that the sperm actually develops from the initial germ cell into a fully developed sperm with a tail. Even though it does have fully developed sperm, it hasn't gained its motility. It takes about three months for sperm to go from that germ cell to an actual moving sperm. The benefit of using testicular sperm is it does have the lowest DNA fragmentation because again, it's the youngest. It hasn't been exposed to all of the reactive oxygen species or the body's immune system. But the drawbacks are substantial. The sperm is not moving, so it, you don't know whether it's, it's alive or has the, the, the capacity to fertilize. It's very immature, and it may also contain the highest aneuploidy. Again, aneuploidy being sperm that carries multiple or an inappropriate number of chromosomes. There are multiple ways to obtain testicular sperm. One is a testicular sperm aspiration, or te TESA. The next is a conventional testis aspiration, or conventional TESI. And the last is a microsurgical testis sperm extraction, or microTESI. This sperm is typically used for ICSI. Again, because it's not moving, it has a hard time, or really it's impossible for it to fertilize on its own. So this is the technique, again, where the sperm is injected directly into the egg. So this is a depiction of a teza. Again, this is, this is where we take a needle to the testicle and aspirate out sperm. This is usually reserved again for people who are obstructed. Again, the example being someone who's had a prior vasectomy. The benefits are this is a fairly minimally invasive technique that only requires local anesthesia, and it's relatively easy to perform. The drawback is that the, the, the success rates are, are much lower compared to the other techniques, especially in non-obstructive azospermia. These are the patients who have an actual uh, uh, sperm production defect. And generally speaking, we get enough sperm for about one cycle of IVF. So you almost want to think of it as each teza is good for about for one, uh, one cycle of IVF. So this is just an image of what kind of sample you get from a teza. On the left-hand side, uh, that is actual, actually some tubules inside the testicle. It's like a spaghetti squash. It's a bunch of stringy material. Uh, so what you're seeing is about how much you can get from one of those needle biopsies. On the right-hand side, this is a picture under the microscope, and I have the red arrow pointing at a tiny sperm. You see those other cells, those are blood cells and tubules. So compare that to the, the mesa, where really all we saw was just sperm. Here you're going to have a lot more cellular debris, and this can sometimes be harder for the embryologist to identify sperm, especially in instances where patients don't make a lot of sperm. So this moves us on to the conventional testis biopsy, or conventional TESA, C-TESA. The benefits to this are that it's a relatively easy pr procedure. It can be performed quickly and can also be done with local anesthesia. The drawbacks to it are that because you're just taking a sort of random biopsy and you're not sure exactly if there's going to be sperm in it, it can be difficult for the lab to find sperm within it. There can be a lot of extracellular debris. For patients in non-obstructive azospermia, the ones who have the production defect, um, this is often a very low yield of sperm. And because you're removing a chunk of tissue, depending on how much is removed, it may affect testosterone levels in the future. Again, this is, this is showing a conventional tesi where uh, on the left-hand side, the testicle is being incised, and then they're taking a pair of scissors and uh, taking a sample. And then on the right-hand side, this is the results of a conventional tesi. 
Uh, right there in the middle, the sort of oblong black part is a sperm. The rest of that is uh, germ cells, red blood cells, and parts of the tubule. So again, you can see it's a, it's a messy looking sample. And the last, this brings us to microtesi. Microtesi is the preferred uh, surgical sperm retrieval technique in patients with non-obstructive azospermia, the ones with a production defect. The drawbacks to this are that it requires general anesthesia. It requires the use of an operating microscope, which not all facilities may have. And this surgery takes, several, uh, takes some time, can be, can be several hours even. The principle on this surgery is that within the testicle, you have all of these tubules. In patients with, with azospermia, the majority of the tubules are not producing adult sperm. Despite this, there may be areas inside that have tubules that do produce sperm, just at such low quantities that it's not making it into the ejaculate. When we do this procedure, we open up the testicle and using the microscope, systematically go through all the tubules to try and find these larger, plumper, fatter tubules that may be containing adult sperm. We then remove those and send them for the embryologist to, to analyze. So when comparing these three techniques in non-obstructive azospermia, the production defect, what we see is that microtesi has the highest sperm yield. Something to take away is that still, this is not 100% that we're gonna find sperm. In fact, you've never seen 100% anywhere in this talk. At best, microtesi will find sperm about 50% of the time in most patients with, with non-obstructive azospermia. Now there are differences among patients and there are characteristics that may uh, improve or lower those chances. Uh, but again, that's, that's outside of the scope of the talk. So in summary, the three main areas where we obtain sperm is from the ejaculate, the epididymis, and the testicle. For men with obstructive azospermia, epididymal sperm is preferred over testicular sperm, again, due to motility, higher fertilization rates. In men with obstructive, or sorry, non-obstructive azospermia, these are men with production defect, microtesi has the highest sperm retrieval rates. All right. And that brings me to the conclusion of our talk, and we can open up uh, for questions. And thank you so much for your presentation. Lots of details, also graphics, but I guess that is really good because we can actually uh, see how it actually works. Yeah, so thank you so much for bringing this and explaining. And yes, you are very right. It is time to uh, answer some questions, but first of all, if you haven't asked yet, because now at least we have one question, go ahead, okay? It is your time to ask your questions, anything that's on your mind. And I'm sure Dr. Thomas will be happy to help you out. And the first question is this one from Emma. Let's have a look. So do you use ICSI as a standard procedure at your practice? Yeah. So um, I will sort of a little bit deflect. Uh, but so in my practice, I deal mostly on the male side. So my goal is to try and get sperm, uh, you know, the most advanced sperm, meaning that has the highest quality uh, to be used for whatever the patients are trying to do. Um, in the United States, uh, ICSI is becoming the standard for, for IVF. Uh, different offices have different, different um, protocols, but uh, yes, I know um, that is not the case uh, around the world. All right, Emma, thank you so much for that question and for, thank you for answering. Uh, that is true. I mean, anything that this can vary, yeah, depending on the country even, I say. So uh, thank you for that. And let's have a look. Let's, uh, sorry, there is, I uh, just need to have a look. There is a question. Uh, okay. All right, let's go to this one. How many TZ or micro TZ can be done in a patient? Sure. Sure. So it depends on what the reason the patient's having it. So for patients who are obstructed, uh, you know, we try to really just do one good procedure. And if there's leftover sperm, uh, freeze it for future use. 
I do have patients uh, who really don't want to go under general anesthesia or have reasons that they can't. And I will do the TESA, the needle biopsy, really as many times as is needed. Um, I've had some where I've done as many as four for four different uh, IVF cycles. Uh, when it comes to the micro uh, I will do one. If we find sperm and they need to, and they, they have a, an unsuccessful IVF cycle and are looking to try and do another, I would consider doing a repeat micro In patients where we do not find sperm on the first micro I I do not do a second micro And again, thank you so much for yet another question and uh, for, for, for your explanation to that one. And now let's go to this question. So what should, okay, sorry. What is the recommended treatment for sperm DNA fragmentation? Sure. All right. So with sperm DNA fragmentation, there can be multiple reasons why patients have it. And if you have an identifiable cause of it, we first try to treat that. So there may be patients um, who come in with a high DNA fragmentation and no one's actually checked their, their semen for other causes such as infections or high white blood cell counts. If that's the case, we try to treat the infection, try to treat the leukocytes or the white blood cells, um, and, and then recheck. If a patient has a varicocele, and a varicocele is dilated veins around the testicle, you know, that's a surgically correctable cause of high DNA fragmentation. Um, so we would treat the varicocele. Uh, in some patients who have idiopathic, meaning we can't figure out why their DNA fragmentation is so high, uh, we have some fertility supplements, which are really just uh, high, um, they're vitamin supplements that are full of antioxidants, uh, and that's what we will put them on empirically. Oh, one more, actually. And um, if they've had cycles, if none of that has worked, um, Rarely, but we do this. Uh, we will actually do a uh, testis biopsy to get the testicular sperm, which should have lower DNA fragmentation, and do IVF cycles using testicular sperm. And excellent. Thank you so much for yet another interesting question indeed and your help with that. Um, okay, let's have a look okay more questions are coming in uh so sorry we had that one before what is the recovery time after micro procedure sure so recovery time is usually about two weeks so uh, my post-operative uh instructions are 24 hours of bed rest with plenty of ice motrin and tylenol for pain uh, they will wear a jock strap or scrotal support just tight fitting underwear I recommend that they wear that for at least three days, uh, but most will wear it for up to a week. Uh, as far as activities, two weeks, no heavy lifting, no sexual intercourse, no masturbation. And after the two weeks, they can reintroduce uh, activities as they feel fit. Certainly, if you're still having pain, take it easy. Um, but again, you can get back to, to, to running, walking, biking, as long as it's not painful. And again, thank you so much for yet another question. Um, there are more of those coming up and quite interesting, of course, as well. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at this one, okay? Uh, it's in regards to the procedures, I guess. Does insurance co cover any of this? Yeah, so it de this depends, you know, on state and countries. Um, so in Florida, insurance really doesn't cover any of these procedures except for in rare circumstances. Uh, some of the states in the U.S. do cover uh, IUI cycles or IVF cycles, um, but as far as overseas, um, I, I don't know the details of most of the most of the countries and what their national health plans do. And thank you for the clarification to that one. And let's have a look at the question here. So in men with non-obstructive azospermia, how many TZ or micro TZ can be done? If I understand, you explain only for obstructive azospermia. No, uh, so we, we talked about both throughout the talk. So with um, non-obstructive azospermia, so this is the production defect. Um, what, it, what this means is that the testicle itself is not, not producing a lot of sperm. Uh, when we do a micro tesi, the plan is to really just do one micro tesi. Uh, and if we find sperm, you know, use it and freeze whatever's remaining. In the events that they have an unsuccessful cycle 
and we're considering a repeat microtesi. Um, I will do repeat microtesi if someone had sperm the first time. If on the first microtesi we did not find sperm, I do not do a second microtesi. So just to say, if, just to say, say that again, if we were successful the first time on a microtesi, we'll consider a repeat. If we were unsuccessful on the first microtesi, uh, I do not consider a repeat. As far as conventional testis biopsies, um, I, I do not recommend them for patients with NOA, um, but uh, you, know, you can perform multiple. Uh, but again, if you didn't find sperm the first time, your chances of finding sperm on a repeat conventional biopsy are very low. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood, of course. Again, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Yet another interesting question. Uh, more of those interesting ones are coming up, actually, yeah. so let's have a look. So you do TZ or micro-TZ in men with higher hormonal profile, example, F FSH more than 30 or small testicles? Yeah, so um, what it sounds like you're describing, a high FSH in small testicles, um, that, that is non-obstructive azospermia. Uh, if you have the capability of performing a microtesi, I would recommend, recommend a microtesi in that instance. Uh, again, the guidelines from the, the ASRM, the uh, American Society of Reproductive Medicine, is in non-obstructive azospermia, microtesi is the preferred technique. Now, if you're in an area where no one performs that procedure, then a conventional tesi uh, is, is obviously what you have to go for, and, and that's going to be your best bet. And excellent. Again, thank you so much indeed. Okay, and let's have a look at uh, next question, a bit of a longer question. So in patients who constant, consistently having a low blastosis number in ICSI cycles, can we use TES as mm -hmm. then? Is there a need to do a DNA fragmentation test before? And what level of fragmentation is the threshold to go for mm -hmm. the TESA? Sure. So um, this is a complicated question with a lot of nuance to it. Um, and it's, I'm, I don't want to give you a, 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 an answer and tell you this is what you should do uh, because there's multiple factors involved. The male side is just half of it. Um, so this could also be effect, being affected by female parameters as well. Um, if you have a DNA fragmentation test that shows high fragmentation, again, look for causes that may be initially causing it, infection, varicocele. Um, the Threshold cutoffs, it depends on what test you use. Uh, there's different tests. There's something called a comet. Um, uh, usually 30% is about what we use as a cutoff uh, before we would consider at least initiating some treatment. Uh, but before going to a TESA, again, we look first for reversible causes uh, before we start trying to use testicular sperm. Again, the reason being testicular sperm having a lower fertilization rate to begin with uh, there are risks uh, by going to the testicle and foregoing ejaculated. And I'm assuming ejaculated with sperm was used in these previous ICSI cycles. All right. So wonderful. Once again, thank you so much. And I just want to mention that, of course, if you would like to get some more details, there is an option for you to get in touch with Dr. Thomas, and I'm sure he'd be more than happy to have a look at some more details from you in order to answer uh, as well, right, properly. Uh, Absolutely. So there will be a link. I can always send it to you. But of course, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, feel free to put your email address if you wish. That's, uh, that's uh, also sure. possible. Um, and so, yeah, let's uh, have a look at the next question that we have from Emma. So what is the role of optimizing testosterone before micro TZ? Sure. Um, so again, this gets into some nuance. Um, for the most part, the patients that we see with non-obstructive azospermia have normal testosterones. Uh, there are cases such as Kleinfelter's patients whose testosterones may be lower. Uh, and we do try to optimize their testosterones beforehand. The concept here is that testosterone is used to get sperm through that last step of maturation, and that by potentially optimizing the testicles production of testosterone, that we may be actually increasing our chance of uh, obtaining sperm. Uh, so in the Kleinfelter's patients, you know, it has been shown to increase your chances of sperm retrieval. Uh, Outside of Kleinfelter's, in the sort of idiopathic, non-obstructive azospermia, the results are a little bit more mixed. Uh, but if they do have a low testosterone level, 
um, and it appears to be correctable with medical therapy using something called Clomid or anastrozole, uh, I will try to increase their testosterones beforehand. I will not use exogenous testosterone, meaning I will not give testosterone gels, patches, or, or any other form, because that will actually decrease the testicular production, production of testosterone and lower your chances of finding sperm. And again, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And someone is typing, so we need to um, wait a bit to, to make sure whether it's a question or not. We will be finishing, of course, slowly. However, uh, don't hesitate. If you have any questions, don't, don't miss that chance to ask Dr. Thomas your questions. And I just put the uh, link. There is an option for you to also um, contact the uh, contact Dr. Thomas, and I'm sure he'll be happy to help you out with some more details as well, that's for sure. Um, and let's have a look, okay? Someone is, again, typing, and it's right here, actually. So let me go straight to that one, which is the maximum value for FSH and LH that could contraindicate TSA. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I don't know that there is a maximum FSH or a maximum LH. So just to, to describe what's going on here is, you know, if you're if you look at patients who are not obstructive azospermia, what you're looking at is as potentially as testicular failure. So when the testicle is not making sperm, the brain senses that and gives the signal FSH to the testicle to tell it to make more sperm. Uh, so the, the, the thought behind, I believe, this question is, is there a point where the FSH mean that signal is so high that we just say to ourselves, there's no, there's no chance we're going to find sperm? And, and I don't know that that data exists yet. Uh, I do use these numbers to determine what kind of medical therapies I may use to try and boost testicular testosterone production. Um, and if the FSH and LH is over 15 to 20, uh, I'm less confident that putting them on a medication like Clomid or HCG is going to, to have an effect. So to summarize, there's really not a cutoff of FSH where I would say there's no chance we're going to find sperm. And again, amazing. Thank you so much indeed for that uh, explanation. Okay, next question. It's a bit of a of topic, but it's mm. interesting. Yeah, so let's have a look. Maybe you can have some advice. Have you seen any changes in semen parameters in patients post-COVID? Are there any studies done so far? So I won't spoil this because some of my colleagues are actually working on this paper, so I won't, I won't uh, give you the, the big results. Um, but so far, it looks like with COVID, it's like any other febrile disease. So in times, in times of stress or fever, you know, sperm counts do decline transiently afterwards. Again, it takes about three months for a sperm to grow up from, a, from the germ cell to an adult sperm. You know, anything that, that, uh, that negatively affects sperm production, so say you go into hot tubs every day, um, that's going to drop the sperm count almost immediately. But it will recover as long as the, the offending uh, event is removed. So that's my, that's my teaser for this. All right. Thank you for the teaser in such case. Um, yeah, definitely something that we all wonder. Yeah, so, so thank you. Uh, for that, and let's wait. Let's have a let's let's just wait, and and uh, hopefully it will be out there soon. <laughs> oh wait, I'm told I'm now being told from one of my colleagues that the paper is actually in publication. So, okay, um, that's great to hear. It up, but yes, okay, it, it, it appears to just be a transient effect and recovers afterwards. That's amazing. Good to know. Thank you so much then for your colleague in such case as well <laughs> for uh, letting us know that. Um, okay, next question is up. So uh, thanks, Dr. Masterson. What is your opinion on testicular mapping versus mic micro teasing? Sure. So um, I do not do testicular mapping. Um, I go straight for micro -tesi. Um Some people swear by it and think that it, it will increase your chances of finding sperm. Uh, but I, I trained in a place where we do straight for microtesi and, and sperm retrieval rates are, are similar. And once again, as you can see, thank you so much. And as you can see, more questions are coming in. More of those are going are going mm -hmm. to be more interesting and more interesting. So does sperm DNA fragmentation, right, increase with male aging? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
DNA fragmentation uh, should not increase with age, assuming uh, you have a healthy individual. Same thing with semen parameters. Um, in patients who do not have chronic disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, metabolic syndrome, you know, sperm counts should remain and shouldn't, should not be declining. Uh, it is typically chronic disease that causes many of these other abnormalities in sperm. And wonderful. Again, thank you so much for that. And so what period do you recommend to wait for IVF in a vaccinated patient? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I don't have a great answer for it um, since I don't do the actual IVF procedures. I don't think there's any data to show that the vaccine is harmful to IVF cycles, um, but I would ask your, your particular uh, physician you know, what their thoughts are and what they do, but I don't believe there's any contraindication. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood, of course. Thank you so much. And at least for now, that might be our final question. So if you have any left, you know what yeah. to do. It will be the final call for the question. So uh, let's uh, have a look at this. What is the typical leftover volume of sample to freeze after a surgical retrieval? Sure, sure. So this is this question. So it's usually not the volume, but you're looking more at the numbers of sperm. So something to keep in mind is that in the freeze thaw cycle of, of sperm, about 50% of them are going to die off. So how much is frozen or, or what you decide to do depends on multiple factors, um, you know, goals of care. You know, if you're talking about a patient who had a microtesi and maybe you only found 10 sperm and you used five or 10 of them or five or you have some left over, maybe it's only one or two, it may be worth you trying to save those couple of sperm. It may not be. Um, so really, it's a, it's, a it's a decision that's kind of made between you and your physician and, you know, what your goals are. Some patients don't want to freeze any of the sperm. They just want to do one and done, and, and that's all. Um, meanwhile, with ejaculated sperm, you may have millions left over that you may want to freeze. So it's, a, it's not a one, a one answer. All right. Again, thank you so much indeed. Um, again, you know, we need to wait a bit. Someone is typing. I'm not sure whether it's a question or if it's a comment, uh, because, of course, there are some thank yous already coming up for you as you can see uh, so let's let's have a look uh, let's wait a bit uh, but i guess we will be finishing so um dr masterson anything else you would like to add before we finish no i really appreciate you inviting me on uh, and i'm happy that you guys uh, are including the male side into these talks uh, because it really is it's 50 percent of of fertility uh, you can't you can't do it without sperm. Yeah, thank you so much indeed for again joining us tonight. It's been great to have you here, that's for sure. And thank you everyone for your incredible questions. And actually, there is a comment from Daniel. And what else can I add to that? You know, incredible questions, agreed, and answers, am amazing discussion, all agreed here. So thank you so much on uh, this. And uh, well, there is one more question from Daniel. I think we can still answer. So is there a difference in a long versus short acting? To testosterone and fertility sure so there's there likely is uh and just to kind of cover what these two things are short acting testosterone is is testosterones that you take dose multiple times a day the two main ones are the testo and nasal gel and the new one jitenzo which is an oral medication uh, compare this to say injections which might be once every week to two weeks to pellets which might be once every four to six months uh, and there is some data to show that the shorter acting testosterones have less effect on your LH and FSH, as well as semen parameters. So the normally about 60% of guys become totally azospermic while on testosterone therapy. Uh, during With the short actings, we don't see that. We see just small drops in their, test, in their sperm counts, uh, but it, they don't seem to go to zero. Amazing. Thank you so much. And actually, in the meantime, there are like two questions more. So let me just go to this one from Daniel. Can we use HCG long term in men with normal testosterone? Oh, boy. Great question. Not not a great answer. Okay. Um, no one's really looked at it. So uh, you know, we, I typically don't give HCG to men who have normal testosterone. 
Um, if they're on the low end of normal uh, uh, and they have symptoms of low testosterone, then we may consider it. And the reason behind some of this is that HCG mimics LH. So theoretically, it, it should not drive your testosterone levels as high and should have less effect on your fertility since you're not suppressing testicular testosterone production. Um, so long-term HCG use, there's not studies, but I can tell you at least anecdotally, you know, people who go to the gym uh, may be using it uh, and they seem to not have a ton of, of Ill, Ill effects from it. All right. Interesting to know that as well. Thank you so much. And two more questions in regards to mm -hmm. testosterone, actually. So which testosterone, testosterone, sorry, do you test total or free? Uh, so I screen using uh, just total testosterone. Uh, and when I, if there's a, if it's borderline, say this, it's a little off topic, but if the testosterone is around you know, 300, so 300 is what's considered the cutoff for, for low. Um, if it's borderline, then I may consider getting a, a free and total on the second, since here in the U.S. to get a testosterone covered and approved, you need two levels below 300. And if there's any doubt as to whether or not it's low, you can get a total, I'm sorry, a free to check if the free testosterone is low. And it just supports your diagnosis. All right. Again, thank you so much indeed. And one more question from Daniel. What is the testicular salvage therapy protocol? Yeah. So I think, actually, I thank Dan for bringing this up. So what, what he's referring to, testicular salvage protocol. So one form of treatable non-obstructive azoospermia, so again, people with production defect, is prior testosterone use. So in those patients, we don't do any of these, these uh, sperm retrieval techniques. We would actually treat medically to try and get their sperm production back in gear. Uh, so again, it's a non-obstructive azoospermia that's caused secondary to medical therapy. Uh, we take them off of the testosterone, and I then place them on HCG three times a week, as well as medication called Clomid. Clomid causes the natural FSH production to increase, and HCG mimics LH, so you're getting both of those signals to the testicle to try and increase sperm and intratesticular testosterone production. Excellent. Thank you so much once again for bringing this up as well. And of course, for your help with all those um, questions, definitely interesting ones, even if sometimes off topic, they are definitely interesting ones. So thank you so much you. for participating in our uh, live event once again, everyone. And uh, again, Dr. Masterson, it's been brilliant to, to have you here. And uh, well, I just want to, uh, we will be finishing for tonight, but of course, remember, that it has been recorded so if you wish to have a look at it once again or perhaps you would like to share it with anyone you can do it it will be available tomorrow on my ivfences.com website but also on our youtube channel and if you subscribe you know that it will be uh, you will be notified that uh, the um, video has been uploaded and one more thing of course we will be back here at 8 p.m uk time tomorrow so um i hope you will be able to to join us as well another topic on male fertility as we are continuing uh, to discuss those topics until this week uh, end of this week so i do hope to to see you uh, here tomorrow Dr. Thomas, it's been lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Have a lovely evening or day, wherever you are, of course. And yeah, take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Yeah, thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you. Bye.